Welcome to the Jam Pack Report today for August the 13th of 2023. I'm Jam Pack Sam, and on today's show, we're talking about a new model of the PlayStation 5 that's leaked on Twitter and could be coming as soon as next month. We also have PlayStation beating Xbox to the punch with 4K cloud streaming. This year's Call of Duty is officially Modern Warfare 3, a Resident Evil remake is now the best-selling game in the franchise, and more. Lots of awesome stories to dig into as per usual, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. Starting things off, is this the PS5 Slim? We head to Tom Warren at The Verge, who writes, Rumors suggest Sony could launch a PS5 Slim in September, and now images and a video of the rumored device have leaked online. And that video came from at BWE underscore dev on Twitter, who wrote CFI-2016 PS5 case, which is the new part number for this device. And here you have it. This is what we have so far. It's a nine second video. And for the audio listeners out there, it basically looks like the standard model of the PlayStation 5, but with slits on either side of the device, and they write at the verge that it could be slightly shorter and slightly slimmer. So not a huge variation from what we already have. This is still a very large device. But the big potential benefit here is that if you look at the way this is designed, it's got a removable disk drive. At least it could have one based on the video that we're seeing here and based on the rumors that we've seen so far. And so what that would mean is that rather than Sony having to produce a PlayStation 5 all digital, edition and then also producing the one that has the disk drive built into it, you just streamline that production and make one model of the PlayStation 5, potentially at that $399 price point, and then if players do want to go out and get that physical disk drive to play physical games, they can go out and buy that for themselves and snap it on the side, kind of in the same way that you already do the side panels of the PlayStation 5 itself. But back to Tom Warren at The Verge, Insider Gaming reported last year that Sony was preparing for a PS5 with a detachable disk drive for September 2023. It's rumored that the next PS5 model will be sold on its own without the disk drive or in a bundle, which means the slimmer model could soon become the PS5 default, allowing people to attach a disk drive at a later date. Currently, you either have to buy a $399 PS5 Digital Edition or the $499 PS5 with a disk drive. Microsoft certainly seems to think that a PS5 Slim model is on the way later this year. The Xbox maker referenced the rumors and documents that were filed as part of the FTC versus Microsoft hearing last month. Microsoft seems to think the PS5 Slim will be priced at $399, the same price point as the PS5 Digital Edition. And that's where the story ends today. Once again, here is the video that we have so far, and I've got to say, this looks pretty good. And it makes a lot of sense. And I've seen a lot of conversation on Twitter and on threads where people are looking at this video and saying, why would I want this? What is the point of having this, especially if I already have a PlayStation 5? Does it bring more power? More than likely not. It does bring a slightly smaller design, but this thing is still gargantuan in comparison to a lot of the devices that are out there on the market today. And my answer to that is that this is not a device for the consumer. This is not a device that's meant to be something that entices you to pick one up. This is meant to be a device that is the new PlayStation 5. This is just the new model that you go pick up. This is the difference between the day one PlayStation 4 and the PS4 Slim. If you had the day one PS4, there wasn't too much of a difference between it and the PS4 Slim. Of course, it looked slightly different, had that matte black on top rather than the piano shiny black, but this is going to be a slight change in the design to make production a whole lot easier for PlayStation. And what that ultimately is going to do is allow more of these things to get out in the wild faster. They don't have to focus on making two different variations that could sell at different rates. They just have one PlayStation 5 and they bundle appropriately, whether the PS5 physical edition, the one with the detachable disk drive bundled into it sells better. Hey, if that's the case, make more of that. If people want more of the digital version, don't include the disk drive and make more of that. It's a really easy way to pivot and probably save some money and time in the process. So 
That's what we have so far. Time will tell, but let me know down below. Do you think this is real? And would you pick one up if this was the next model of the PlayStation 5? And in my case, as somebody who doesn't already have a PlayStation 5, it sounds like I'm waiting at the right time. I'm going to be able to get a cheaper version of the PlayStation 5 if I do choose to go buy one. That also gives me the opportunity to play digital games or physical games without having to choose between one model or the other, and I'll probably save some money in the process. Next up, PlayStation has beat Xbox to the punch with 4K cloud streaming. Anne Marie Ostler at Games Radar has the story, and she writes Sony has begun rolling out its PS5 cloud streaming service, which, unlike Xbox, comes with a 4K option. The feature, which allows you to stream various PS5 titles without having to download them to your console, is now being offered to select PlayStation Plus Premium members as part of a beta test. Users over on Reset Era who have been invited to sample the service have reported that it offers a range of resolutions, including 720p, 1080p, and 1440p. Most notably, it also offers the option to play in 4K, which cloud gaming currently does not offer. This means that despite having a lengthy head start when it comes to cloud streaming, Microsoft has been pipped to the post by Sony. And then we have Clubreal commenting on it, saying, of course, PlayStation does 4K cloud gaming before Xbox does it, lol. I mean, it's only been three years of Xbox cloud gaming and feedback on that topic. According to Reset user Arashi Games, the PS5 games currently available to stream are God of War Ragnarok, Horizon Forbidden West, Fortnite, Fall Guys, Destiny 2, Returnal, Demon's Souls, Death Stranding, Sackboy A Big Adventure, and Destruction All-Stars. Trial versions of Demon Slayer and Resident Evil Village are also included. Sony unveiled its plans for cloud streaming PS5 games back in June, saying, quote, Our goal is to add this as an additional benefit to PlayStation Plus Premium as part of our ongoing efforts to enhance the value of PlayStation Plus, end quote. They go on saying, We think it's important for premium members to be able to enjoy as many games as possible via cloud streaming. As more games continue to launch on the PS5 console, we look forward to adding cloud streaming capability for PS5 titles in addition to the PS3, PS4, and classic titles that are already available for premium members to stream. End quote. Streaming is said to be a big part of PlayStation's future, as earlier this year, Sony announced Project Q, a handheld device featuring an 8-inch HD display sandwiched between a DualSense controller that lets you play games installed on your PS5 over Wi-Fi. So, 4K is a big deal for a lot of people. This is something that is going to give Sony a little bit of leverage in the cloud gaming space race, if you will. But, when I saw this story... My immediate reaction is, why wasn't Xbox the one to get this first? I mean, like Clubreal pointed out, this is three plus years of feedback from people that have played Xbox Cloud Gaming who have said, I would like to see 4K Cloud. And we've seen recent comments from the FTC discussions and deliberations in July that show Microsoft is breaking even, generating a little bit of profit on cloud gaming, but it by no means is what they thought that it was going to be. It is not the game changer that they had predicted it would be at this point in time. Time. And I'm not writing off the significance of cloud gaming. It is going to be a big part of the gaming industry going forward. But I head over to Windows Central Gaming, where Jess Corden recently wrote, Xbox Cloud Gaming is seeing increased queue times as demand surges. People are blaming GTA 5, but is something more going on? And that's the question that I want to pose today, because Jess Corden writes this great article, and it's got a couple of good points. Number one, Grand Theft Auto 5 is back on Game Pass, and you have that cloud gaming functionality, which is going to be enticing for a whole lot of people to dive in and see what Grand that Auto 5 does have to offer for them, or even just go back for nostalgia's sake, play it for a little while, and then dip out. On top of that, Fortnite has also recently come into Xbox Cloud Gaming, and you do not need any kind of subscription service to play it. You just boot it up and enjoy. No matter what device you're on, you can play Fortnite for free, which is a big benefit there. But towards the end of the article, Jez points out some very interesting facts here. Microsoft is also offloading some of the GPU cycles from Xbox Cloud Gaming to AI processing services when they're not in use as a part of Microsoft's Big Chat GPT and Bing Chat push. The AI processing may also be inducing queues as servers flip priorities around. It's a downside, but it also crucially extends the business viability of the service in a world where Apple and Google won't allow Microsoft to monetize on their platforms. You'll notice that no games, either from first or third party developers on Xbox Cloud Gaming for Google Play, have in app purchases or DLC enabled. You can blame Google for that. And then Jazz talks about his analysis of a potentially cloudy future if this is going to be the future of Xbox Cloud Gaming. And I can tell you right now, 
I dove in, Jove, I guess, I dove in and I checked this out for myself to see if I was going to be impacted by these long queue times. And I was. And so my question is, are more people diving into Xbox Cloud Gaming to check out games like Fortnite, like GTA 5, like all of these other games that are coming into the service? Or is Microsoft just looking at the numbers and saying, maybe we don't need to focus so heavily on cloud gaming? And PlayStation, following the market leader in cloud, had a big push to say, let's get 4K before Microsoft does to become a leader in the cloud gaming space, which I think is great. Once again, this is a perfect example of two competitors pushing each other to be better than they already are. But who is the 4K cloud gaming for? That's for people that have the best of the best internet that want to stream cloud games on their PlayStation 5. I was talking about this on Project X Talk with my co-host Kevin Ainsworth earlier this week, and I said, if I'm sitting down on a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox Series X or whatever, and I'm going to be playing a game for a long period of time, I don't want to stream from the cloud. That's when I want the full 4K native resolution, 60 frames per second if possible, lights are dimmed down, backlight is on, surround sound is on, HDR is enabled. I want the best of the best. I want the cinematic experience. And I can't imagine that this is going to be something that is able to suffice those needs for the hardcore players. The 4K jumping into a game and streaming it from the cloud is cool, but it is something that's going to be people just diving in, seeing what a game is like, potentially before downloading it in full, or bouncing between game and game. Uh, once again, not ragging on the fact that they are introducing 4K cloud gaming. I think that's awesome. I just wonder if it's something that's going to pay off in the long run. How many people will actually be able to use this and leverage it for themselves, especially when you look at people that have slower internet speeds uh, that aren't able to get that 4K resolution on their current internet network. And so I think the Microsoft could very well be backing away from cloud gaming a little bit. Not to say that they aren't going to continue it and that they aren't going to continue to support it, but are they going to continue pouring resources into it and trying to push for 4K when maybe their numbers say the majority of people are playing Playing cloud games in 720p on an iPhone 7 or an iPod Touch or whatever kind of analytics they might have from that. They know what their use case is and maybe 4K just isn't in that right now. It absolutely is something they should push for and as the capability expands they probably will uh, but I wouldn't say that PlayStation beating Xbox to the punch with 4K cloud streaming is the death of one or the other. I think that this is just one step in the cloud gaming space that we're seeing but it's cool to see PlayStation, a big competitor in the gaming space, especially in the console space, get this kind of functionality. So we'll see where this continues to go could be a great option for people that might be able to stream games in 4k maybe on a pc from playstation in the future i mean this is the first step of many to come uh, but cloud gaming is still out there still doing things i'm just wondering how much it's going to be doing stuff in let's say 10 years time it'll be bigger but will it be dominating the industry like so many people seem to think that it might Next up, this year's Call of Duty is officially Modern Warfare 3, and this is where we all act surprised. Matt Wales over at Eurogamer writes, Today's official reveal comes courtesy of a brisk teaser trailer, which, alongside a whole lot of hyperactive whizzing between abstract pointy things, includes glimpses of a few familiar faces from the Call of Duty series, namely Captain Price and Vladimir Makarov, and a voiceover warning, never bury your enemies alive. This year's Call of Duty installment has, of course, been rumored to be Modern Warfare 3 for quite some time. The name first surfaced back in May, and Activision effectively confirmed it in July when the name appeared during a spate of DMCA takedowns aimed at leakers online. While official details remain minimal at this juncture, we do know Sledgehammer Games is the primary developer on this direct sequel to last year's Modern Warfare 2. And so here is your teaser trailer. To the surprise of no one, Modern Warfare 3 is on the way. In my humble opinion, it's way too soon for a sequel to last year's Call of Duty game. Why do we need it so soon? And we have had a couple of other teasers that have dropped. One shows a mixture of live action, Makarov actor with in-game Makarov, a little bit of gameplay spliced in there. But it just feels like this has turned around so quickly. And it's very clear, abundantly clear, that this was originally designed as a standalone DLC or a big DLC expansion for the game. There is going to be some story here. It is going to be expanding on the story of Modern Warfare 2, as anybody would expect from Modern Warfare 3. But even in the social media promotions, you see them celebrating the fact that all Modern Warfare 2 weapons and progression carry over to Modern Warfare 3. 
Well, my friends, that sounds like the same game, getting a big piece of DLC. And so I think that what this is, is a full premium Call of Duty release to hit the needs of the shareholders and to hit those expectations. But this is going to be the first game in a very long time from the Call of Duty franchise that I don't pick up on day one. I'm out for it. I did not buy Vanguard a couple of years ago, but I've bought the two that have come out since then. And whenever I checked out Modern Warfare 2 last year, I picked it up on day one. I was really enjoying it, played through the whole campaign, which was great. Really enjoyed the stories that were told there. Uh, the multiplayer was even fun for the first couple of weeks. But as it tends to go, the gameplay got a little bit more complex over time. The weapon system just got to be a little bit frustrating just because I had to unlock specific attachments and red dots and things. Why don't I have a red dot as soon as I jump into the game? I mean, that's just a fundamental part of Call of Duty. And for me, as somebody who doesn't want to have to grind Call of Duty as my go-to game... It doesn't entice me to just jump in and play a couple of rounds. Even now in July of 2023, August now of 2023, I don't feel compelled to go back and play any more Modern Warfare 2. And so since it doesn't have that longevity of the Call of Duty games that I played back in the day where map packs brought me back throughout the summer season and then the new Call of Duty launched in the fall, I don't really feel a need to drop 70 bucks on what is feeling more and more like something that really should have probably been a $40 expansion. That's kind of the way that I see it right now. So time will tell if this is actually good. Glad to see Sledgehammer in the driver's seat here because Modern Warfare 3 was one of my favorite Call of Duties back in the day, uh, but this is not going to be one that I end up picking up. So let me know down below, is it one you are going to be diving into if it is something you are interested in yourself? But now diving into a couple of delays that have come our way, courtesy of a Devolver Delayed. And if you miss this, Devolver Digital always kills it with their marketing. But this time around, instead of putting out notices that games that people have been looking forward to have been delayed in kind of one of those black background, white text Twitter announcements, they decided to make an entire three-minute showcase out of it. And Gamatsu has the rundown for us here, where they write Angerfoot, Pepper Grinder, The Plucky Squire, Stick It to the Stick Man, and Skate Story have all been delayed to 2020. 24. They write, the news came via Devolver Delayed, a digital event announcing which of, ex which of its games excuse me, will miss their scheduled release dates in favor of a 2024 release, and you can watch the full video below. But I wanted to call this out on today's show because I love the style of Devolver. I love the fact that they could have made one of those we're sorry kind of posts, but no, they own it. They talk about what games are still coming out in 2023, plenty of things to look forward to here, but there's also going to be a couple of delays. And in a year where we've got a huge fall of releases, I don't think that I'm going to be upset that Angerfoot isn't going to be launching because I'm probably going to be busy playing games like Starfield. People are going to be playing Spider-Man 2. Those are just two of the biggest examples of games coming out this fall. I mean, the world is in love with Baldur's Gate 3 right now, so I don't think the plucky Squire getting pushed to next year is really going to ruffle anyone's feathers. Now, admittedly, some of these games are probably some people's most anticipated games of the year. But as always, I'd rather have a game get delayed than come out and number one, get overshadowed by a ton of other games that have come out this year, but also just simply not be finished. Definitely don't want that. So uh, Skate Story is also one, by the way, very excited to see how that actually plays. I don't know if it's going to play like trash or if it's going to be just as good feeling as it is good looking, but that one's had my eye for quite some time. So if you want to watch the full three minute uh, Devolver delayed, you absolutely can. Also, Angerfoot is a very good time. I played that on a Steam Next Fest last year, uh, but I would love to know your thoughts down below. Do you think that Devolver delayed was a good way to announce some delays or would you rather have something that's potentially a little bit more official? Would love to hear your thoughts on that. Now we have a couple of hits to wrap up today's show. A Resident Evil remake is now the best-selling game in the series, and that is Resident Evil 2. They write over at Kotaku that the top five best-selling Resident Evil games, as reported on recently in some earnings calls, were Resident Evil 2 with 12.6 million copies sold, followed by Resident Evil 7 at 12.4 million, Resident Evil 5 comes in at number 3 with 8.8 .8 million, Resident Evil 6 is also at 8.8 .8 million, and Resident Evil Village at 8.3 million. Meanwhile, they write, the most recently released Resident Evil game, the RE4 Remake, has already sold an impressive 4.9 million copies since it launched earlier this year and has a way to go before it overtakes any of the top-selling games in the franchise, but I won't be too shocked, the author writes, to see it eventually overtake Village and Six in the coming years. I also equally would not be shocked at that. 
Kind of disappointed that Resident Evil 3 Remake isn't up there, but Resident Evil 2 absolutely deserves the top spot because whenever I checked out that remake a couple of years ago, I mean, that was the real Resident Evil experience that stays true to the source material, but that also does enough to modernize the game and really make it something that people would want to play in 2020, 2021, and beyond. It was just a really, really good game. Same could be said for Dead Space Remake as well, but with Resident Evil 2, there was more that had to be done with that, and they did a great job of executing on a game that feels like it is a modern AAA release that once again also stays true to that source material. So Resident Evil 2 is now your top-selling Resident Evil game of all time. But speaking of great games of all time, Quake 2 Remaster is out now on PC and consoles courtesy of a big QuakeCon announcement. Chris Holt over at Engadget writes, the rumors were true. Bethesda has announced an upgraded version of Quake 2. Best of all, you can play it today on PC, Xbox One, Xbox Series X and S, PS4, PS5, and Nintendo Switch. The enhanced edition is also on Game Pass on PC, Xbox consoles, and Xbox Cloud Gaming. Those who own the original game on GOG or Steam are getting a free upgrade, and Night Dive Studios worked with Bethesda to modernize id Software's 1997 first-person shooter. You can relive the single-player campaign or try it for the first First time with Sonic Mayhem's original soundtrack and all kinds of other enhancements. The visuals have also been upgraded to include widescreen support, 120Hz refresh rates, and 4K resolution. Content that was cut at one point is back in the enhanced edition of Quake 2, which includes the Nintendo 64 port as well, and you'll be able to dive back into the original expansions, Mission Pack The Reckoning, and Mission Pack Ground Zero, which include more than 30 extra single-player levels and 20-plus deathmatch maps between them. There's a brand new expansion called Call of the Machine as well. Wolfenstein, the new Colossus Studio Machine Games, which is working on an Indiana Jones game, built 28 more campaign levels and a completely fresh deathmatch map for this expansion. On the multiplayer front, there's split-screen support, including local and online co-op for up to four players, and you can battle it out in deathmatch, team deathmatch, and capture the flag with up to 16 players. Full crossplay is a welcome inclusion across all platforms. However, if you're on PC and want to hop into a lobby with your buds who are playing on console, or via the cloud, you'll need to use a controller. This is to nullify the aiming advantage the keyboard and mouse players have. Last but not least, there are some welcome updates to make Quake 2 more accessible. Players will receive an accessibility option notification after they install the game. Settings include high contrast, voice chat transcription, input remapping options, aim assist, and the ability to automatically switch to a new weapon when you pick it up. I love these remakes. I love that Quake got one. I love that Quake 2 got one. Uh, and if you're like me, I love a good boomer shooter. We've talked about Proteus here on the channel before. I've talked about my love for games like old school Doom as well, Doom 64. That kind of experience is exactly what I want more and more of. And Quake 2, Quake in general, that's one of those hardcore fundamental uh, games that made those boomer shooters popular today. This is what people are basing their games off of. And Quake 2 Remake, uh, or Remaster, whatever you want to call it, looks like it fits the bill. It stays true once again to what the game was, but it looks like it runs flawlessly, smoothly, and on top of that, there's some new content as well. So if you played through everything, spent hundreds of hours with it back in the day, there is something new here for you to dive into and play. And the fact that it's on PlayStation, Xbox, Switch, and available via Game Pass, you can't get any better than that. So Quake 2 is officially back in action. I see it. It's installed on my Xbox right now. Have not gotten the chance to play it yet, and I might even play it on PC just to get the full experience. But uh, if you're a fan of those old school shooters, Quake 2 is one that you've got to check out. And the fact that it's got everything included on top of the Nintendo 64 version of the game, which who would have thought that would be in there? Uh, just such a cool addition. So really glad to see this, and I would love to hear if you guys are diving into it down below as well. But one other game that I've been diving into this week is, as per usual, Halo Infinite. We all know that I love it. We all know that I can't get enough of it. And so right now, there is a fantastic event going on that you've absolutely got to check out if you are a fan of Halo. And this is Cyber Showdown 2. I have been obsessed with this over the course of the past week, and as per usual, this is a limited time event that's running for the next couple of weeks, and there is a 10-tier event pass. And... As per usual, you can finish it in one sitting, but the stuff that's included in this event pass 
is unmatched in comparison to other event passes that have come before it. Everything is Synthwave themed, which is of course near and dear to my heart, but you've also got some cool stuff in the premium shop as well. A new model for the BR, which I did end up picking up, uh, but some really cool weapon camos as well. But the 10 tiers in the free version of the Battle Pass are what you really need to pay attention to. You'll see it coming up here whenever the trailer loops back around, but there is a Halo Arcade Pinball Machine charm, which I love a good charm, and there's also a Halo Combat Evolved VHS charm. When I saw that, I knew I had to dive in as soon as humanly possible because that is something that was made for me. That is my kind of content. And on top of that, Dredge also just recently came into the game, which is a new map based on Countdown from Halo Reach. And it plays just like Halo Reach did back in the day, but with those Halo Infinite mechanics. The new sniper rifles, the new shock rifles, the new equipment that's in the game. I mean, the fact that I can now grapple across Countdown in Halo Infinite's engine... It just feels good. It works well, and I love spending time in the game. And I said it before, I'll say it again right now. This is the best Halo Infinite has ever been since it launched. There are tons of maps in the game, tons of new different ways to play. You've got plenty of new modes coming in and out of rotation, and some that are sticking around for the long term. And you never have problem diving in and finding a populated server. There are always people that are playing. It's so good to see Halo Infinite thriving like this, and of course, just like everybody else, I'm excited for what's to come with the future of Halo to see where the franchise ends up going. But right now, if you have not already, dive back in, check it out, because this free event pass gives you tons of cool stuff, tons of cool cosmetics, all just for your time. Spend a couple of hours with it, and I promise you, you will not regret it. And to wrap up today's show, Stray is now on Xbox, and you can literally see the tweet right here. There is, in fact, a Stray Cat on top of an Xbox Series X. I do hear it does get pretty warm depending on what game you are playing, but I wanted to call this out because this is a long-standing PlayStation exclusive. Now it's finally coming over to Xbox, and while it's not included a Game Pass at launch, you do get a pretty hefty discount if you are a Game Pass subscriber. It goes from $29.99 down to $23.99, and this is one that I'm actually going to be picking up right after this show show and I'm a big fan of supporting developers when they do bring their games to Xbox to show that there are in fact people here that do want to buy and play your games uh, and Stray is one that's had my attention since it was announced for PlayStation just a really cool vibe good looking game so if you do want to pick up Stray it's out now and I'd love to know down below are you going to dive in and check out this cat game now that it's finally on Xbox or have you already played it I'd love to know your thoughts and that's today's Jam Pack Report. If you're new here and you enjoy what you see or what you hear, hit that subscribe button over on YouTube, add the show to your podcast feed, and get it delivered right to you every single Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. It's always a blast putting together the week's gaming news and catching up with you all, and I hope you enjoy it as well. But until next time, you have a fantastic week. I'll talk to you soon, and as always, keep on playing. <laughs>